To put itself in position to deliver on its promise to land on the moon next year, SpaceX has had to completely reinvent the way it ensures that rockets won't blow up on the launch pad when they lift off and explode in the sky. So this is SpaceX's new trick to face the 33 engine ignition. Well, SpaceX is supposed to learn from failure to succeed, so now we should take a look back at their valuable lessons during last month's Starship flight. First, the no clamp slow throttle up meant Starship stayed on the pad for a long time, throwing up concrete, rock, and sand in all directions, damaging the pad, nearby facilities, and the Starship itself. Remember those clamps? On a rocket like the Saturn V, they'd actually hold the rocket in place for a couple of seconds while the rocket came fully up to power. Then the clamps let go. SpaceX did it another way. They opened the clamps before the countdown even began. Then they slowly throttled up the rocket on the pad. That's why it took Starship, with twice the power of a Saturn V, almost twice as long to clear the tower. It just sat there for a lot longer, blasting away at the ground. That was all part of the plan, but it was also part of what doomed the flight. By the time it left the pad, that debris had already destroyed three of Starship's engines and likely damaged valves and systems that would lead to additional engine failures as well as an incorrect fuel mixture. Starship was slow to reach every point in the flight plan, suggesting that other engines weren't able to throttle up to compensate for the lost engines. At what should have been stage separation, either software errors or more smashed hardware kept the main booster firing long after it should have shut down. The result was an uncontrolled spin that required Starship to be destroyed. Based on these failures, SpaceX has immediately come up with two main solutions for the future of Starship. The first mitigation will be a change to the final seconds of the countdown. During the maiden launch, Starship fired up its engines over a 5-6 to six second period. Musk added that during Booster 9's launch, this will be reduced by around 50% to around 2.5 seconds before the vehicle lifts off. For the next flight, we certainly will be taking off faster. So this for this flight, we were we erred on the side of uh, kind of babying the engines and just sort of gently sort of starting each engine one at a time. However, the key solution will be a water jacketed sandwich or what we call the deluge system. In fact, SpaceX ships Starship Deluge hardware from Florida to Starbase in January, but SpaceX then decided to let the flight go before this was completed. Honestly, almost all rockets use some sort of deluge system to prevent their own exhaust from damaging or destroying themselves or their surroundings. A large volume of water sprayed into the space just below the rocket's engines and can prevent an immense acoustic energy or sound they produce from wreaking havoc. A deluge also helps protect launch pad hardware by allowing some of the energy in the exhaust to boil and vaporize water instead of eating it into concrete or steel. But CEO Elon Musk has infamously stated that SpaceX is intentionally attempting to build an orbital launch site that doesn't need a flame diverter for Starship, the most powerful rocket in history. That's gone about as well as one might expect until last month. So what is needed will have to happen. At this point, SpaceX has started making some progress on the transpirational steel plate system that will be installed under the Starship OLM. And based on the images taken at the scene, Ryan Hansen has surpassed himself here. This answers so many questions the community's been asking about. The supply pipes and manifolds have been measured and accurately modeled. Basically, you've got a water-filled plenum with plenty of holes, pressurized high enough that water will be flowing out the holes even under the pressure of the exhaust. So from one direction, you've got a flow of water. In the other, you've got a flow of super hot exhaust. There will be an established temperature gradient between the two. Everywhere except at the center, there will be a radial flow of steam blowing the exhaust away from the plate, and in the center, the water pressure is higher than the exhaust pressure. The exhaust never touches the plate, it's only exposed, worst case, to steam. All SpaceX has to do is maintain the water flow high enough that the temperature at the steel plate never exceeds 1000 degrees Celsius, and that the water doesn't boil until it's outside the plenum, and the plate's good to go. Honestly, in the real world, that plate never sees more than a couple hundred degrees Celsius. It doesn't matter to the plate how hot the water gets after it's no longer in contact with the plate after all. And remember, SpaceX routinely keeps combustion chamber walls directly exposed to much higher temperatures and pressures from melting. They are very experienced at heat flow analysis. If there's any concern here, it's not that the plate will be damaged by the exhaust, it's that you're going to get a lot of turbulence and unstable behavior that might reflect back at the engines. And that's going to be a pretty impressive wall of steam leaving the launch platform. Not as chunky as flying concrete, but potentially quite damaging anyway.
In short, like any SpaceX design, it may need improvement in the details to get to the concept. This approach lets them eventually build a Stage 0 launch machine that can readily be reproduced. This is absolutely essential as SpaceX is parlaying its role in NASA's Artemis moon landing, not to mention the money, to create hardware and services to be sold to other customers. Note SpaceX recently has a competitor's back as NASA recently selected Blue Origin as the second Artemis lunar lander provider. While SpaceX plans to use Starship, a gargantuan rocket and spacecraft system designed to function on its own, Blue Origin had a more straightforward plan to develop a lunar lander, similar to those used for the Apollo missions. Blue Origin's lunar lander would ride as a payload on a separate rocket while SpaceX's Starship is in its own self-contained system. Functionally, however, Blue Moon would take on the same role as the spacecraft portion of SpaceX's Starship. For Artemis 3, Starship would launch to the moon empty. It would rendezvous with NASA's Orion crew capsule, which aims to carry astronauts to lunar orbit. After the astronauts transfer vehicles, Starship would then handle the work of touching down on the moon's surface, allowing astronauts to explore, and then returning them to Orion in lunar orbit. For Artemis 4, Starship would also dock with Gateway, a planned space station intended to orbit around the moon. But companies will be required to complete Pathfinder missions or test flights before they can conduct such landings. Next, the company plans on using the enormous rocket to open up opportunities in deep space and closer to home. With a fully reusable Starship, satellites can be captured and repaired in orbit, returned to Earth, or transferred to a new operational orbit, SpaceX says in its Starship user's guide. Visual Visualizations of this show Starship's bullet-shaping fairing opening like the mouth of a largemouth bass to capture or discharge payloads in orbits. As for commercial customers, two billionaires are waiting for Starship besides Musk. The rocket's most reliable customer, however, may be SpaceX itself. By using Starship's expansive cargo bay, the company says it could deliver 400 Starlink Internet satellites per launch, as opposed to the 60 that can be carried by a Falcon 9 rocket. Musk started SpaceX with the goal of launching enough people and supplies to colonize Mars, a task that will take hundreds if not thousands of Starship flights. Despite the destruction end of the first test, this distant dream has edged closer to reality. Seven weeks have passed since Starship's first orbital launch, and while SpaceX has kept a relatively low profile regarding the mission specifics, one thing's become evident. The tireless efforts of the Starbase team to address and enhance the launch pad have been truly remarkable. These SpaceX Stage Zero changes are going to shock you. Just a few days after SpaceX's launch pad was damaged, the Starbase team started excavating the dirt and concrete beneath the orbital launch mount to make room for the new water-cooled steel plate that'll be used. They totally dismantled the previous pipeline system of the launch mount. Over 30 and a half meters or 100 feet long rebar cages for the foundation were recently dismantled, showing that the piles have become stronger. Significant excavation work has taken place around the orbital launch mount, accompanied by the installation of sheet piles throughout the ground. These sheet piles play a vital role in safeguarding the area against potential cave-ins during the ongoing excavation process. By providing additional strength and support, they create a secure foundation for the installation of rebar, which will in turn accommodate the future placement of water pipes. This week's progress on the OLM is very evident as the pile caps are now exposed and the compression ring has been cut all the way around, revealing the rebar underneath. You can also see the addition of the dewatering pipes, with drilling taking place around the perimeter of the site to facilitate water removal. These latest developments are major strides in the construction process. Thank you Chrome Kiwi for this awesome render. Based on observations, it appears that the structures on the beach side are positioned in front of the underground cryo lines. This strategic placement is likely intended to prevent any undermining effects, especially considering the proximity of a road adjacent to the area. Additionally, the starting grade might be relatively shallow, potentially eliminating the need for a traditional perimeter wall. These thorough and thoughtful design considerations reflect an efficient approach to the construction process. Lots of plans in store for the future, and the SpaceX team is already halfway to wrapping up the water deluge system for Ship 25 and Booster 9 firing. While the orbital launch tower didn't need many repairs, the tank farm's been undergoing repairs, with shells seeming to be buffing out nicely. According to Elon, SpaceX will replace these tanks with horizontal hot dog-shaped tanks that'll be better protected from launch pad debris. 
The vertical tanks intended to store liquid methane were replaced last year by horizontal tanks better suited to the purpose. Elon Musk was quoted last month saying that the launch pad upgrades should be completed in about a month. Actually, in May 2023, a couple weeks after retiring from NASA, ex-head of human spaceflight Kathy Luters joined SpaceX to oversee operations at Starbase to give government customers comfort and confidence is that Starship is going to be a real thing around which they can base future plans and operations. So here's hoping that Starbase's Stage Zero comes back strong this month. In addition to these activities, at the production site, the team's been recently dismantling old buildings, including the triangular windbreak known as the low bay that was originally intended to shield the welding operations from the wind to give place for new buildings. So they can ensure a smooth manufacturing process, SpaceX plans to complete the full new Star Factory in multiple phases, with an estimated time frame of four to six separate stages. This approach aims to minimize disruptions during expansion. According to documentation from Texas' Department of Licensing and Regulation regarding the ongoing phase of Star Factory expansion, a particular section of the facility is referred to as the Heavy Metal Building. Although the document mentions a size of 10,000 square feet, it's speculated that this figure may be inaccurate by a factor of 10. Whoa! If this assumption holds, the corrected size could be around 100,000 square feet, approximately matching the current development area. The estimated construction cost for the heavy metal building stands at 32.5 mil, making it approximately 27 times more expensive than phase one of the Star Factory. While both phases share a similar footprint, except for a large pit in one corner, it's suggested that this pit could serve as a significant press pit akin to the gigapress utilized in Tesla factories. SpaceX will be spending $5 billion or even more on its Starship vehicle and launch infrastructure by the end of the year. That's according to court filings and comments made by the company's chief executive. That suit alleges the FAA improperly carried out an environmental review of SpaceX Starship launches from Boca Chica, Texas. To make that argument, the company included a statement from Brett Johnson, the CFO over at SpaceX. He said that if the plaintiffs win, the company's ability to make money off Starship launches for both NASA and commercial customers would be substantially delayed and jeopardized. He specifically noted that since a 2014 record of decision by the FAA allowing SpaceX to develop launch facilities at Boca Chica, SpaceX has invested more than $3 billion into developing the Boca Chica facility at Starship Super Heavy Launch System. The statement didn't break out the investment between the launch vehicle itself and infrastructure. SpaceX chief executive Elon, in an April 29th online discussion on Twitter, the social media giant that he also happens to own, estimates that the company would be spending about $2 billion on Starship this year. It'll probably be a couple billion dollars this year, $2 billion-ish, all in on Starship, he said, adding that he didn't expect to have to raise funding to finance the work. He also said in that conversation that he expected Starship to launch four or five more times this year and would be surprised if the company didn't achieve orbit by the end of the year. That schedule depends on both the technical progress SpaceX makes in repairing the damaged launch pad and getting the next vehicle ready for flight. Musk is known for making aspirational schedules, as well as the outcome of the suit. Johnson, in his statement, outlined details of the consequences of any delays and launches caused by the suit. That includes around $1 billion in milestone payments on its NASA Human Landing System Award linked to the first orbital launch and subsequent steps, which include the demonstration of in-space propellant transfer, an uncrewed lunar landing, and crewed landing. Neither the agency or SpaceX have really outlined the schedule of milestone payments on their $2.9 billion award for the Starship lander development for the Artemis III mission. The SpaceX motion to intervene is one of the few updates since the suit was filed. The court set a July 1st deadline for a response of pleading from the FAA. With a multitude of upgrades made to the launch pad, there's growing optimism that Starship will soon obtain the necessary licensing to start back up its flights again. Future versions of Starships could carry more than 150 tons into orbit, 60 tons more than SpaceX's Falcon Heavy, and land on other planetary bodies like the Moon and Mars. Nice! A rocket like that could change the dynamics of launches to Earth orbit and deep space by bringing more and larger payloads on a single launch. NASA is also planning to use the spacecraft to land astronauts on the lunar surface as soon as December next year as part of the Artemis program. Elon wants to use the Starship to dominate the heavy launch market and to colonize Mars. But this maiden flight was much bigger than any one billionaire. 
Starship and its boosters have attracted customers from space truck tourists to the DoD, which is seeking to use the rocket as a way to fly cargo anywhere on Earth in just half an hour. But first on the list of Starship customers is NASA, and amid all the fire, smoke, and publicity was the first flight test of the lander chosen to return astronauts to the moon. And that just about wraps it up for today. Please share your ideas in the comments. Your support motivates us to create more quality videos. And for that, thanks so much for watching, and we hope to see you next time. Bye.